Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's program. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Gary Sarkissian, and I'm the Director of Education and Content at CFA Society Boston. Today's program is the second installment of our four-part Distinguished Lecture Series that is brought to you through the partnership of CFA Society Boston and New Frontier Institute. Throughout this series, we feature highly topical presentations by widely acknowledged authorities on issues of particular interest to investment practitioners. In today's discussion, we look into one of the long-held and generally accepted principles in modern finance, that equity risk should translate into greater return on average over time relative to treasury bills. Well-referenced studies such as Ibbotson and Sinkelfeld's Stocks, Bonds, Bills, and Inflation have established this important relationship that is foundational to finance theory and asset management in practice. In contrast, today's presentation, which is titled, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills?, may sound counterintuitive and challenge the standard precepts for the average practitioner. Our guest speaker for today, Professor Hendrik Bessenbinder of Arizona State University and author of the original and important 90-year study of U.S. stock returns for which this presentation is named after, will present on a follow-up to that study in a more global context using a universe of approximately 64,000 global common stocks. In that study, he shows that less than half of the returns of individual stocks exceeded the one-month treasury bill return over matched horizons throughout the 30-year study period. In addition, he will highlight the level of wealth creation that is concentrated amongst a handful of firms and the implications that has for investors. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Richard Michaud, who will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Michaud is president and CEO of New Frontier Advisors and a member of CFA Society Boston's Programs and Education Advisory Council, where he helped sponsor this four-part Distinguished Lecture series. Dick, please go ahead and take it away. Dick, you'll need to unmute. Unmute, unmute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hendrik Hank Bessenbinder. He is a professor of finance at Arizona State University. He holds the Francis J. and Mary B. Labriola Chair at the W.P. Carey School of Business. His prior faculty positions include the Eccles Business School at the University of Utah, the Goizueta Business School at Emory University, and the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. He completed his PhD in finance at the University of Washington in 1986. Hank's research and teaching interests include financial management, international finance, stock markets, foreign exchange markets, energy markets, trading costs, trading strategies, and financial risk management. His research has been published in the top finance journals, including the Journal of Finance, Journal of Financial Economics, and the Review of Financial Studies. He is managing editor of the Journal of Financial Quantitative Analysis, Associate Editor of the Journal of Financial Economics and Journal of Finance, Financial Markets, and past Associate Editor of the Journal of Finance. He teaches university courses in corporate finance, investments, financial markets, and financial engineering at the master's and doctoral levels. He has been nominated for and received a number of teaching awards. His consulting activities include that with the NYSE, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, IDC, DOL, SEC, and CFTC, and uh, among others. Just a note to say today, we are having a presentation of a unique and truly important paper for understanding stock markets and equity risk. Great to have you here, Hank. All yours. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Gary, and uh, thank, uh, thanks, uh, Richard. It's uh, it's a pleasure. To be here, and uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, I really appreciate your uh, taking some time to uh, to join us here today. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and uh, and share my screen and uh, pull up the presentation slides. Um, so uh, as Gary mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, presentation is titled "Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills." Um, uh, working off the title of of a recent paper that I wrote uh, by the same name, uh, an alternative. Uh, title would have been uh, some potentially surprising facts uh, about long-run uh, long stock returns. So let me start with a little bit of uh, little-known 
finance research history. So we go back to the late 1960s, and this might be a little hard to imagine at, uh, at this point, uh, but uh, uh, we didn't always have large uh, comprehensive databases of uh, uh, stock return history to, to study. Uh, the first comprehensive database was put together by the organization we now know as uh, CRISP uh, at the University of Chicago uh, in the late 1960s. So uh, in the course of combing through the uh, New York Stock Exchange records and putting together the first uh, database, the question arose, well, at what frequency should we measure and, and uh, compile returns? Uh, the answer could have been weekly, it could have been monthly, could have been quarterly, could have been annual. For that matter, it could have been uh, at the decade horizon. Well, the leadership conferred and they issued a decree that CRISP would report monthly returns and that's what we should study, uh, we academics in particular. Okay, that's a spoof. Uh, there was no such decree. Uh, nevertheless, uh, most studies, and, and in particular, most academic studies, uh, study monthly returns. And uh, since, of course, there's a lot of monthly returns, they focused on means, averages, standard deviations of monthly returns. Uh, that's what tends to get used for sharp ratios. They're sometimes annualized, uh, but still they're uh, typically created from the monthly returns. It's what's typically used for mean variance optimization for estimating alphas, et cetera. Uh, John Cochran, very prominent and distinguished researcher, uh, who some of you will be familiar with, uh, shortly after uh, Gene Fama shared in the Nobel Prize, uh, wrote, when Gene uses monthly returns, we use monthly returns. Uh, now, the spirit of his comments was uh, in uh, deference to the great impact that, that Gene Fama has had on the profession. Uh, and I would just note that this is one of the, uh, 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 one of the ways uh, most of us have been studying monthly stock returns. All right, so uh, the line of research I wanna talk about uh, breaks from that norm. Uh, in particular, really pretty straightforward idea, I'm studying on, I'm uh, studying long run compound returns to stock investments. So the original study and the one that was named Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills focused on 26,000 US stocks, 26,000 individual US stocks, essentially the universe of stocks that have been listed on the US markets uh, since 1926. Uh, but I'm also going to, and, and really mainly going to talk about uh, uh, a follow-on study that uh, goes global, 64,000 global stocks. Now the databases uh, for global stock returns are not as comprehensive and the global study is limited to a 30 year period, 1990 through 2020. Uh, and then I'm gonna briefly uh, talk about uh, some findings in a study of US equity mutual funds, uh, where again, uh, the distinction is simply compounding the returns instead of studying arithmetic means of short horizon returns. Uh, if you're more interested, you can find these and related papers by just uh, searching under my name on the ssrn.com website. All right, so the 2017 paper, paper was titled, Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills? Um, the paper, when you dig into it, was really about skewness in returns. Um, but who reads a paper with skewness in the title? All right, I know the answer is some of you would read a paper with skewness in the title. Um, so I'll be very upfront. The uh, title of the paper was chosen strategically, uh, chosen to attract readers. Uh, I think something about uh, posing a question that uh, most educated people, informed people, uh, believe they already know the answer to uh, has a tendency to attract readership because uh, you want to, uh, to know, uh, uh, well, what, what can we learn that's, uh, that's new about this subject that we uh, think we know the title to? Well, here are the key findings of the paper. A few stocks have very large compound long run returns. We'll talk a little bit more about just uh, how large. While at the same time, the majority of stocks have negative long run returns. Um, not just by the way that they underperform treasury bills, they underperform zero. Uh, most stocks, the majority of stocks have negative long run returns. So the large positive market risk premium that we're all familiar with, and I do wanna clarify, 
I'm not trying to, not seeking to overturn uh, the empirical fact that the broad stock markets, the stock markets as a whole, do generate large positive risk premium. So uh, the large positive risk market risk premium that does exist is not driven by a typical stock. It's attributable to a relatively few stocks with very large realized premium. Um, I'll talk more about this measure, dollar wealth creation. But when we measure the risk premium in dollar outcomes, the original paper showed that the top 4% of stocks could explain all of the realized premium in the US market since 1926. So that was the original paper. Um, my co-authors and I have since extended the analysis to a global study, 64,000 global stocks from 43 countries. And I can convey much of what we find with just a few frequency distributions. So uh, 64,000 stocks over 30 years, of course, they're not, they're not all present for the full 30 years. Uh, just took all of those monthly returns, created a frequency distribution of the monthly returns. This is uh, separately for U.S. stocks and non-U.S. stocks. Um, there is a long right tail. You see, I've got it graphed here. Hopefully, you can see my cursor. I've got a graph here out to 200%, and then there's uh, uh, a number of outcomes beyond 200%. So there is some evidence of skewness already in the long right tail. And there's also this kind of uh, odd peakedness uh, right at zero, which is presumably due to uh, price rounding and, and non-trading on occasion. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to mainly is that in the area where the vast majority of the outcomes are, say between negative 40% and positive 40%, uh, this distribution is pretty close to symmetric. Um, and mainly, I want to show you the contrast as we simply take those monthly returns and compound them for longer intervals. So the, uh, the next slide is annual returns, just taking the uh, returns that uh, are observed within a year and compounding them. Um, we're starting to see more evidence of the long right-hand tail. The, this graph runs out to uh, 400%. Uh, but you can see that there's a, uh, there's a spike for uh, uh, those occasions where annual returns are more than 400%. Uh, still somewhat symmetric, say between negative 50 and 50, uh, but now we're seeing more of these returns out here at 100 and 150%, starting to see signs of positive skewness. Now we go to uh, the next slide is going to be decade returns. So just take all of the monthly returns within a calendar decade, decade and compound them. And at this point, the frequency distribution looks fundamentally different. Uh, there's no longer a peak uh, near, the, uh, the, near the mean or the uh, median. Uh, the most common outcomes are down close to negative 100%. And uh, the long right tail is getting longer. Uh, this graph is out to 900%, uh, 10 baggers, if you will. Uh, and uh, then show, you see the spike for those that are above 900%. Finally, the uh, full sample. Uh, for some stocks, this is the full 30 years. For most stocks, they're present for less than 30 years. So just compound returns over whatever portion of the 30 years the stocks are present in the sample. And uh, the pattern that was already showing up in the decade returns is even more pronounced. Uh, no evidence of a, uh, uh, of a rise in the distribution around the mean or the median. Uh, most outcomes, the modal outcome is uh, very near negative 100% and a long right tail. Now, uh, I'm not showing you any formal statistical test here, but I think it's self-evident that these long horizon compound returns are nowhere near normally distributed. Nothing like normally distributed. A um, little bit of the more specific data from, uh, from the study of global returns. Um, so these are the, uh, the full, full horizon, lifetime I call them, lifetime within the sample, within the 30 years. 
uh, for the 64,000 global stocks. Um, so 64,000 global stocks, the cross-sectional mean lifetime return, a nice positive number, 290%. Uh, here's global excluding the US. All right, have some subsamples down here, the developed world excluding the US, emerging markets, geographic subsamples, European stocks, Asian Pacific stocks, and down here, a couple of specific countries, United States and United Kingdom. So the prior study had focused on the US. So here I wanna mainly focus on, on non-US. But what I wanna point out is that for all of these subsamples, the mean return across stocks is a nice healthy positive number. On the other hand, the median return across stocks, negative for every subsample. For the United States over the last 30 years, negative 9%. For the other samples, the median more negative. So it follows immediately, the majority of the stocks are, have returns that are below zero. When I compare to the US Treasury bill, great, slightly higher hurdle, a lower percentage of stocks in the vicinity of a third to 40%, depending on the subsample, have long-term compound returns that exceed US T-bills. Now the issue is, skewness, positive skewness in the distribution of the long horizon, the compound returns. Uh, just another way to see uh, that it's skewness, a property of a positively skewed distribution is that you have a few really big observations that pull up the mean. So that the majority of observations, the more typical observations are below the mean. So this last column here is just to compare the long run returns for individual stocks to their own value weighted mean. That's of course a higher hurdle, uh, but as I say, it's another way to see that the issue is skewness. Uh, in every one of these samples, only a minority of the individual stocks outperforms the stock's own mean return. Um, this other measure, so what I've showed you the last few slides is, is compound returns, buy and hold returns, percent per period. Uh, another measure that uh, uh, I reported on in the original paper and uh, uh, seems to have attracted a fair amount of interest is what I called wealth creation. Uh, so let me clarify what, what the measure is. Um, it's shareholders, shareholders in aggregate, not an individual shareholder, shareholders in aggregate, their wealth as of the end of the sample as compared to the wealth they would have had if they had earned US Treasury bill returns on the same capital investment. So you can think of it as an ex post risk premium, what they earned for taking on the risk of being in the stock market uh, instead of being in low risk treasury bills. So you can think of it as the ex post risk premium, but instead of being measured in a percent per year, it's measured in dollars at the end of the sample period. So it's a dollar risk premium. So I compute this for every stock and then add it up across stocks. Um, so this considers the final market capitalization, but it also considers all earlier cash flows to and from shareholders. All right, when I sum this across all 64,000 stocks over the last 30 years, so I call this net wealth creation from the stock markets. It's a remarkably large number. Uh, over $56 trillion. Just let that sink in for a minute since a uh, trillion gets thrown around a little bit more these days than it used to. And uh, yes, 1.9 trillion is a really big number. Uh, but global stock markets since 1990 have created 56 trillion in wealth for their investors. A remarkably large number. Um, if I only focus on the companies that have positive wealth creation outcomes, um, and I'll refer to that sum as gross wealth creation, the total is almost 80 trillion. So another way to put it is that uh, the difference between these two numbers, just shy of 24 trillion, that was the uh, wealth extinguished by those firms that underperformed treasury bills. So uh, almost 80 trillion gross, 56 trillion net. So the question that uh, is posed in the title, do stocks outperform treasury bills? Well, in aggregate, yes. 
uh, and to the tune of trillions of dollars. Yet at the same time, most individual stocks fall short of treasury bills. So those are the two facts. They're both true at the same time. And the reason is skewness. Uh, here's a listing of the top 20 global firms in terms of sh shareholder wealth enhancement over the last 30 years. Um, you'll see some numbers, uh, or sorry, you'll see some names that are very familiar uh, near the top of the list. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Tencent, Walmart, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and you see the rest. Uh, you see the rest of the list, uh, and some remarkably large uh, numbers. Uh, Apple alone, just shy of two trillion in shareholder wealth creation over the last thirty years. Microsoft, one and three quarters trillion. Amazon, over one point three trillion. And you see the last, the uh, rest of the uh, of the list. Um, one of the things I would like to draw your attention to is how much of the total wealth creation is coming from just these top firms. So Apple with just under 2 trillion in wealth enhancement for shareholders is alone 2.5% of what I call the global gross wealth creation or 3.5% of the global net wealth creation. Uh, Microsoft, we add Microsoft along with Apple, the two stocks together, 4.6% of gross wealth creation, 6.6% of net. And you see, as we go on down the top 20 firms, top 20 firms out of 64,000 have accounted for more than 15% of the gross wealth creation, 22% of the net wealth creation. Um, just uh, because it's uh, rather interesting, and uh, I found that uh, there does seem to be a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in uh, lists of uh, winners. Uh, this is the top 20 non-US firms in terms of uh, shareholder wealth creation. Uh, so again, uh, many familiar uh, uh, names there, uh, Tencent uh, being the best performing non-US firm, uh, a couple of uh, Swiss firms uh, right uh, behind that, uh, Samsung in fourth place, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, and you can see uh, you can see the rest of uh, of the list. Uh, just because it's also interesting, um, what are the firms at the opposite end of the spectrum? The very worst firms in terms of destroying shareholder shareholder wealth over the last thirty years. Uh, PetroChina uh, is the uh, champion. Um, it's uh, rather noticeable that uh, the top 10 is dominated by uh, uh, Chinese and particular Japanese firms. Um, this is, uh, I think, in some sense, a little unfair to the, to the Japanese firms uh, and, and what's unfair in particular. Uh, we started, my co-authors co and I started this study as of 1990. Uh, mainly because that's when we had good broad coverage uh, in the, uh, uh, the CompuStat database that we used. Uh, some of you will be aware that the uh, Japanese, the Tokyo Exchange, uh, reached its all-time high uh, at the end of 1989, uh, literally the day before we started the study. Uh, so, you know, if we had been able to include, uh, uh, say, a, a, an earlier decade, uh, Japanese stocks would have looked much better. I mean, 30 years is, is a long sample, but uh, 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 there will be some things that are unique to that 30 years. And I think Japanese stocks performing so, so poorly is, is one of those things you, somewhat unique to, uh, uh, to the 30 years employed. Um, outside of the uh, Japanese firms dominating the, uh, the worst list, uh, uh, there's an interesting uh, cluster of, uh, of telecommunications firms uh, high on, uh, on the list of, of wealth destruction. All right, let's return to this uh, issue, the degree of concentration in, uh, in wealth creation. Uh, so a large portion of the overall stock market wealth creation is coming from just a few firms. Um, so uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, the top 20 firms over the last 30 years accounted for 15% of gross, 22% of net 
wealth creation globally. Uh, if we take it to the top 50 firms, they account for 24% of gross, 34% of net, net wealth creation. So 50 firms out of 64,000 explained more than a third of the remarkably large net wealth creation over the last 30 years. Uh, here's some additional information on the concentration of wealth creation. So uh, for uh, the same uh, subsamples that I uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the number of firms in the sample, the gross wealth creation. So if we just add up uh, the wealth created across those that had a positive number and then net wealth creation when we added up across all the firms. So let's, let's start with the United States, the, uh, the country that I had already studied uh, previously. Uh, 41 uh, trillion in gross wealth creation, 35, 36 trillion in net wealth creation in the last 30 years from the 17,000 firms in the study. Now, if we focus on just the top 1%, which for the United States is 173 firms, the top 1% accounted for 62.5% of the gross wealth creation, just short of three quarters of the net wealth creation. Now, if we go to uh, the non-US sample, the general pattern is even more concentration of wealth creation. So uh, let's go to the global sample excluding US firms, 40, 45, almost 46,000 non-US firms in the study. The top 1% of those firms, that's 457 firms, accounted for 60% of the gross wealth creation and 112% of the net wealth creation. So to restate that last finding, the net wealth created by non-US firms over the last 30 years, just over 20 trillion, less than 1% of the firms account for all of the net wealth creation in the non-US part of the global sample. Well, why? Why is stock market wealth creation concentrated in so few firms? The dollar wealth creation, why is it concentrated in so few firms? It's basically the interaction of two forces. Uh, first of all, the large positive skewness and long run compound stock returns. Uh, Richard asked me just before we started how other academics had reacted to what I've been reporting in this series of studies. There was a few of them who said, well, of course, uh, but a lot larger number, including myself, were surprised by how much compounding, or sorry, how much positive skewness there is in long run compound stock returns. Uh, in any event, it's there, it's a fact. Uh, with enough reflection, it becomes less surprising. I think that's why a few of my colleagues have said, well, of course, that they had given it sufficient reflection ahead of time. Uh, but in any event, it's there. Compound stock returns, compound random stock returns have a lot of positive skewness. Uh, the second thing is just uh, variation in market cap across stocks. We have big stocks, we have small stocks. So the really big wealth creating firms are at the intersection. They're the ones that earned outsized, outsized percentage returns on large initial capital basis. Uh, but those two explanations, they do interact with each other and, and reinforce each other. So let's take, uh, let's take Apple, which is the biggest outlier in the 64,000 stocks. It's, it's the one stock that created more wealth for shareholders than, uh, than any other. So when Apple first entered the database right after their IPO, uh, they represented 0.14% of US market capitalization. Uh, at the time, there were uh, just over 4,700 firms listed on the US exchanges, uh, which if you do the calculation, Apple at the time of its IPO was seven times bigger than the average stock. So Apple did start from big base. 
uh, if they had been one seventh as big as the average instead of seven times as big as the average and generated the same percentage performance, they wouldn't lead the list. Uh, so uh, uh, the size of the firms is, is relevant. Um, but by September 2020, the uh, end point of, of our study, uh, Apple represented almost 6% of US market capitalization, which made it 241 times bigger than average. So the fact that it uh, started as a big firm is relevant. The fact that it grew from seven times bigger than the average to 240 times bigger than the average, that is long run performance, uh, also contributes and contributes even more. So uh, there are two explanations for, for why there's so much concentration of wealth creation skewness in long run returns and variation in size. Uh, but uh, the two explanations overlap with each other to a, to a significant extent and, uh, and Apple's uh, illustration of that. Uh, what about portfolios? You might uh, wonder. Uh, everything I've shown you so far has been about how individual stocks uh, uh, perform and the distribution of outcomes across individual stocks. Um, so, of course, there's a, a near limitless number of ways portfolios can be formed and, and are formed. Uh, so uh, uh, the study of, of the question, what about portfolios, uh, uh, can go on for a long time. Uh, here's a quick look at a relatively simple approach. Uh, U.S. equity mutual funds. Um, equity mutual funds are portfolios. Uh, they vary a great deal in terms of their portfolio strategies. Uh, so they're also rebalanced portfolios. Um, and of course, there's a big literature studying uh, mutual fund performance. But uh, like the rest of the literature, most of that, uh, most of the studies focus on short horizon returns, monthly returns, sometimes annual returns. All right, what my co-authors and I did here was just take the, uh, the uh, set of uh, US equity mutual funds in the CRISP mutual fund database uh, from 1990 to 2019, took the individual mutual funds and compounded their returns. Now, uh, uh, like stocks, mutual funds come and go. Uh, the majority of those funds were not there for the whole 30 years, 29 years of, of the study. Uh, but we just compounded over whatever period it was there. All right, so anyway, if we just started with the monthly returns without compounding, okay, we had uh, just over a million monthly returns. There's, uh, by the way, 7,700 7, mutual funds in the study. And we had just over a monthly, uh, a million monthly returns. So the mean monthly return, this is post fee, uh, 63 basis points. Um, the matched SPY return in the same month was 70 basis points. All right, we took uh, SPY, the, uh, the uh, spider ETF. We took that as a uh, proxy for the overall market uh, that uh, since it's traded and it is net of fee is something that uh, an investor in principle could have could have captured. So that's what we use as the uh, as the benchmark. All right. So this this is just the monthly returns. Now parallel to what I did in in the individual stock paper, just take those mutual fund returns, compound them within a year, compound them within a decade, compound them for the full set of months that they're present in the data. All right, the mean fund return, of course, increases as you compound. Uh, the median also increases. But notice that the median doesn't increase nearly as much as the mean because skewness is showing up as we compound the returns. Here's the uh, average matched SPY return. So for every, for every fund, we measure the SPY return over the same months that, that the uh, fund is present and has return data. Uh, so every fund, every fund has a matched SPY return. Here's the mean matched SPY return. Here's the percentage of the funds that outperform the SPY. All right, 47% in monthly returns, 40% in annual returns, 39% in decade returns, 29, 29.5% over their full lifetimes. Uh, now on the upside, uh, the majority of the equity funds are outperforming T-bills. So skewness is present, 
but its effects are not as dramatic as they were in the individual stocks. Um, but skewness remains relevant for portfolios as showing up, uh, or, sorry, the, the, the skewness that arises due to multi-period compounding is relevant for portfolios. Uh, you can see it, see it in the skewness coefficient itself. Uh, you can see it in a declining percentage of mutual funds that outperform the SPY as you increase the horizon over which you measure the returns, compound the returns. Um, so potentially surprising results. They were to me. They did seem to be surprising to a number of people. I mentioned that a few of my colleagues responded, well, yes, of course. Uh, let's try to dig into the uh, why some people were not surprised uh, angle on this. Uh, and uh, let me do it with a numerical example. Uh, before, before I launch the numerical example, uh, compounding, those of us who uh, have ever taught introductory finance or have been in an introductory finance course have, uh, have learned about compounding. But we typically illustrate compounding for students by compounding a no one rate of return. So those nice smooth graphs, excuse my uh, crude graphic, uh, graphic uh, aid here, those nice smooth graphs that uh, we use to illustrate the effect of compounding come from compounding a constant return. Our issue here is that we're compounding random returns. All right, so just with a numerical example, about as simple as a numerical example can be, uh, the single period return is going to be either 20% or negative 20% with equal probability. So the mean is zero, there's no skewness. All right, how about two period returns? We'll assume statistical independence and just work out uh, the two period returns. All right, you could get two negative draws in a row, in which case your two period returns negative 36%. Uh, there's a 0.25 probability of that. You could get uh, one negative return and one positive return in either order, in which case your two period return is negative 4%. There's a 50% probability. You could get two positive draws in a row in which case your two period return is 44% with probability 0.25. All right, this is a positively skewed distribution. And all we've done is taken a symmetric distribution and compound it for two periods. Uh, but, but it's worth spending a few seconds to look at the details of this, of this example. So 75% uh, chance of a negative return and asymmetry. Okay. If you get two negative draws in a row, that's bad. You're down 36%. If you get two positive draws in a row, that's not only good, it's better. You're up 44%. And clearly 44% is a bigger number than 36%. All right, what's going on in this example? Oh, well, first of all, let's just uh, clarify. Uh, the mean two period return remains zero. If you take the probability weighted average of those uh, outcomes, it's still zero. Uh, but the median's negative and the skewness is positive. All right, that's just one example, but the example generalizes. If you compound returns, you induce positive skewness. Uh, in other examples, if there was more volatility, if there's more volatility in the short horizon returns, you get more skewness. And if you compound longer, you get more skewness. By the way, the first of these, that's why for the mutual funds, we do see skewness, but it's not as dramatic as it is for individual stocks because the volatility of the monthly returns or short horizon returns for portfolios is not as large as the volatility for individual stocks, diversification, of course. Uh, the more volatility there is in the short horizon returns, the more positive skewness you get in the long horizon returns. Anyway, that's what's going on mechanically. And uh, as I said, a few of my colleagues were not surprised. It was because they had already thought about this point. Those of us who are more surprised is because we hadn't really thought about this point.
All right, so what are, uh, what are the implications of uh, these empirical facts? Um, truth is, uh, I don't know all the implications. I'm still trying to sort through the implications uh, myself. Um, and I think it's uh, maybe some of the richest things to, uh, to talk about is, is thinking through what the, uh, what the implications of these facts are. But let me give you some thoughts that have, that have gone through uh, my head so far about uh, what, what does it mean that uh, long run returns behave in the way, in the way that they do. All right, so we know that venture capital is characterized by most investments losing money, uh, often losing all your money, but a few investments generate really big returns. Sometimes you get on, in on the ground floor of the next Tesla or Amazon. Uh, the very first time I presented uh, the results of, of the original study was for the Chicago Quantitative Alliance. Um, and, and the way I phrased it then was, I'm going to tell you about an asset class. And in this asset class, most of the individual investments lose money. The most frequent outcome is losing all your money. But there's a few that deliver really large returns enough so that being in the asset class is well worth your while. And then I said to them, but you might respond, we already know that about venture capital. And of course, my punchline was, but I'm not talking about venture capital. I'm talking about long-term investments in publicly traded equity. So this basic pattern, strong skewness, including losses on most investments, uh, that doesn't disappear after the IPO. We have the same long run patterns in public equity in the US and even more so globally. Um, why did this su surprise a lot of people? Um, frankly, I think it's because we usually study short horizon returns. You study monthly returns and then take averages and standard deviations of monthly returns, uh, you just don't see this. Now, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't rocket science to say, let's take the same database and compound the returns. Uh, it was really something of a stroke of luck, really, that, uh, that I thought to do this. Um, but uh, you don't see it unless you actually compound the returns. Uh, so I'm beginning to come to the conclusion that this pattern of net losses on most investments, big gains on a few investments, uh, seems to be a fundamental attribute of investing in an entrepreneurial economy. Portfolio concentration versus diversification. For those investors that don't have any unique insights about the markets, uh, the phrase that we sometimes use in the academic literature is uh, for investors that are not informed. Now, when, when we use that phrase, we don't mean investors that are dumb. We just mean that investors that don't have any particular insights that uh, competing investors don't, don't also have. Um, for these investors, which I really think probably includes most investors and, and most individual investors, the results reinforce the importance of diversification. Uh, for all the reasons that we've already been talking about for the last 40, 50 years or so, plus the additional, the additional angle is that if you diversify, those big winners, you know, identifying those big winners in advance is obviously going to be devilishly difficult. But if you're broadly diversified, you will have them in your portfolio. So uh, diversification ensures that you do get a slice of, of the big winners. So I, I really think for, for many investors, I, I go back and forth between should, should the word be many, should the word be most, uh, but for a lot of investors, the evidence just reinforces what you had already heard, that diversification uh, is an excellent idea. Um, but I don't think that's the lesson for everybody. Um, so for one thing, skewness. 
There is skewness in compound returns. And the riskier your portfolio is, the more skewness there is in long run returns. And a, and a preference for skewness is not necessarily irrational. A preference for the small chance of a big payoff is not necessarily irrational. As somebody who studied economics, I can't tell people, well, you're wrong to value skewness. That's, that's up to an individual to decide if that's a desirable uh, property or not. Uh, so skewness is strong, especially at long horizons. And it's stronger if you're not fully diversified. Um, and then beyond skewness preference, um, I'm trained as an economist. The phrase comparative advantage or competitive advantage from economics, I personally think is one of the most powerful ideas in philosophy. Uh, comparative advantage being figuring out what you're better at than your competitors. All right, I think some people, some investors do have the right comparative advantage to be active investors. Uh, the market needs active investors. You know, I don't want to get uh, caught up in a big debate over how efficient are the markets. We could be debating that for a long time. Uh, I do know the markets are competitive, uh, but I think that uh, some investors have the right comparative advantage to be successful active investors. The big question for the rest of us is identifying who has the right comparative advantage. Uh, but I do think there are some, uh, some investors with the right comparative advantage that should be active uh, investors. And the results here show just how big the gains can be on a narrow portfolio. Uh, if you're either lucky or skilled enough to identify those big winners in advance. Um, if you were carrying around in your head the idea that long run returns are approximately symmetric, you would have one particular view of the potential gains and losses from a narrow portfolio. Uh, if you carry around in your head the accurate picture that long run returns have tremendous positive skewness, you have a different idea of the potential gains and losses from a narrow, narrowly uh, diversified portfolio. All right, uh, portfolio selection and evaluation related to the previous slide, of course. So if you select stocks at random, in other words, if you don't have any skill, don't have any information, if you select stocks at random, you're going to underperform the market-wide benchmarks more than half the time. And that's even in the absence of management fees or trading costs. That's just the nature of a skewed distribution. Randomly selected elements of the distribution have a more than 50-50 chance of underperforming the average which is the market as a whole. Um, so uh, uh, that's a fact of portfolio management. Uh, we, we know as an empirical matter that uh, the majority of act actively managed funds do underperform market-wide benchmarks. And I showed you that that becomes a larger percentage as you compound returns. Uh, it's usually attributed to fees or costs or behavioral biases. Um, it's more than that. Uh, skewness is going to ensure that. Uh, at least if we think of uh, these as uh, uh, selections at random. Now, of course, some of you will bristle at the idea that you're selecting at random, but you're, uh, you're fighting against the forces of skewness is, is my point. Um, mean variance optimization and the Sharpe ratio. Uh, widely used, widely studied, widely written about. Uh, they're often justified by the assumption that returns are nearly normal, normally distributed. And we've actually known since the 60s that even, even short horizon returns are not normally distributed. We know they have the fat tail. Uh, but on top of that, at longer horizons, the distributions don't look at all similar to the normal distribution. So the intellectual uh, uh, framework of let's do mean variance optimization or focus on sharp ratios because returns are approximately normal, uh, just falls apart if you consider returns over long horizons. Um, here's another point. Um, implementing mean variance efficiency 
is devilishly difficult because of estimation issues. But let's set that aside for a moment. Let's suppose you do manage to identify a portfolio that's mean variance efficient based on monthly returns. I've got bad news for you. Your portfolio is not mean variance efficient in annual returns or any other horizon. Um, I didn't get a chance to go into it here, but it's in my paper on mutual funds if you want to dig that out. Uh, alpha also depends on the return horizon uh, and not just for random measurement issues. The true alpha of a portfolio depends on whether you're measuring alphas in monthly, annual, decade returns. And uh, I'll just uh, leave it as a question. Uh, do we need to uh, reassess portfolio optimization and performance measurement? Uh, are uh, alphas and sharp ratios computed for monthly returns what we should really be looking at? Um, I'll just leave it as a question. And uh, more generally, uh, let's, uh, let's open it up to, uh, to learn your reactions or what follow on questions uh, you might have. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen at this point. Uh, Hank, thank you so much uh, for that informative and enlightening presentation. This is very impactful research that you have done, and uh, we're looking forward to further engaging in this discussion. Um, with that in mind, it's now time to turn to Q&A. Now, I notice a lot of you have been submitting uh, questions in the chat box, which is okay, but we recommend that you use the Q&A button uh, just because it's a little bit easier for us to kind of track the questions as they're coming in. Um, and so we'll try to get through those questions uh, in the limited space of time that we have today. Um, I, I thought we can maybe kind of kick things off with a poll with the audience to try to get their sense um, of the conclusions of the study. Um, an area of focus, of course, is the, uh, the influence uh, that this will have for active managers. Um, I'd be curious to hear the audience's take on this. Um, and of course, you might be slightly biased, uh, given how Boston is home to uh, many well-known long-only active managers. But without further ado, let me go ahead and pull up the poll here. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick screen, uh, screen share. And here's the question, and I'm going to launch the poll in Zoom so that everyone else can see it and vote. And um, the question goes as follows. The conclusions from the study help argue in favor for uh, passive strategies, active strategies. Could it support both sides of the debate or you really think the, the conclusions might be um, pretty much neutral? Be curious to hear what everyone has to say. We'll give it about a minute. Over half of you have voted so far. It's coming in quick. All right, so almost three quarters of you have voted. We'll get a few more seconds here, and then we'll share the result. All right, three, two, one. I'm gonna stop the poll right now, and I'm gonna share the results. Interestingly enough, almost half of you are saying you can go either way with this. Uh, that's actually an interesting setup, and you know, Hank, I, I'd be curious to get your take on this. 49% um, of the audience said that both active and passive, and just by the way, for the folks that are going to be watching the recorded session of this since they can't see the numbers, 29% say passive, 18% say active, 49% say both active and passive, and then 5% of you say it doesn't have an influence uh, one way or the other. So with that being said, Hank, I'd be curious to get your take on this. And um, what, if you're an active manager as well, um, how would you... How would you take? How would you digest these findings and try to incorporate it in your investment process so that you can maintain that advantage? Well, uh, great, uh, uh, great questions. Uh, uh, it was actually uh, it was a great idea to do this poll, and, and the results are really interesting. Uh, so, so this is clearly the the biggest uh, question and the one that's been posed to me most often since I first circulated the uh, the study. Um, it's been kind of an interesting experience for me because, you know, the truth is we academics uh, kind of toil in uh, obscurity uh, much of the time. It, it's relatively rare that, uh, that a large slice of the world or notable slice of the world pays attention to our research. Uh, but the paper did, did generate uh, quite a bit of press coverage. And I would say that most of the press coverage uh, tilted towards the interpretation that uh, this, uh, these findings uh, support passive strategies, passive indexing strategies. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting is, is uh, uh, that then some people pushed back uh, and uh, 
uh, sometimes failed to distinguish between what the press had said about what, my, what I wrote and what I actually wrote. <laughs> because, uh, you know, some people then started to say, well, Bessenbeiter is saying that, uh, that uh, you know, this tells the whole world they should all be passive, which, which I really never said. So in all honesty, I think the answer is that this provides ammunition for both sides uh, of the great active passive uh, debate. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, line with the plurality of people who said it supports both. Uh, one, one small anecdote, and in the interest of full disclosure, I, uh, I have a consulting uh, uh, arrangement with uh, Bailey Gifford out of Edinburgh, Scotland. And I don't know if you're all familiar with, with Bailey Gifford, but uh, they're, they're definitely not a, a diversify passive uh, outfit. Uh, they, uh, they're long-term investors uh, in narrowly selected portfolios. Uh, but in any event, uh, when I was uh, first uh, getting to know them, uh, they told me that they were at an investment conference shortly after my paper came out, and uh, not surprisingly, the great active passive debate came up, and there were people in the same room, uh, both referring to my study to argue their side of uh, uh, their side of the active versus passive uh, debate. Uh, so anyway, I do think there's ammunition for both sides, and and I think it comes down uh, rather uh, neatly on the. Uh, uh, comparative advantage question or the skewness preference, uh, really those two things. But uh, uh, if you prefer skewness or you believe you have, uh, and, and you know, maybe believe is a squishy word, but uh, if there's solid reason to believe you have, uh, solid reason to think you have uh, uh, the right comparative advantage, uh, I think it, uh, uh, it uh, uh, sharpens uh, uh, the arguments in favor of active management. Uh, it can be tremendously uh, rewarding if, if you get it right. Uh, as I said, much more so than you would have thought if you're carrying around in your head uh, the idea that uh, distribution is symmetric. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, if uh, you know, if there's no objective reason to think that uh, you have the right comparative advantage, if you don't particularly care, care about skewness, uh, if you don't think you can locate managers that have the right comparative advantage, then the arguments for passive. Uh, uh, index-based investing are stronger than ever. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting the way that uh, uh, the way you can look at these conclusions. We have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to get through these uh, as best as we can. Uh, Charlie had a question. This is actually an interesting one, and I think it could apply to both the global study and and the U original U.S. study. The original U.S. study had a very long time span, so it, it, it you know you probably can glean some more information um, over the decades, but. He's asked, uh, can you please talk about any observations about return distributions by sector or industry? Um, only to a limited extent. I, I do have uh, some follow-on papers that can be found on, on SSRN. Uh, and in one of those, I broke out uh, results by, uh, by industry. Uh, I think I only had a dozen industries, so it might not be as fine as some people would be, uh, would be interested in. Uh, so I'd refer you there for, for details, but uh, there were some, some interesting kind of uh, uh, headline results that came out of that. So if you look at the, the firms that are at the very top of the wealth creation list, uh, you see a lot of tech stocks there. Um, but it turns out that uh, uh, while technology stocks uh, uh, dominate the, the biggest winner list, uh, technology stocks as a group over the years uh, have not been uh, the, the most reliable performers. Uh, telecommunications and pharmaceuticals have actually uh, been more reliable uh, uh, on average, uh, but of course, you know, there's thousands of technology stocks, uh, but you know, you take, take the whole group, they haven't been the most reliable. So it's, you know, you wouldn't want to take this as just an, the fact that there's some tech stocks at the top of the list is not an endorsement of tech stocks as a sector. Right, right. It, it's also interesting just kind of seeing that how the, the concentration over the years, I'm, I'm imagine if you would have stopped your study, I'd say a certain decade and not gone all the way up to say 2016, um, the, the, the conclusions probably would have been the same, but the, 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 the list of the top companies that would have created the most wealth would look different. But um, we have a, a question here uh, regarding um, equal weighted versus cap weighted portfolio. So uh, Ted is asking, this would seem to refute the idea that an equal weighted portfolio will out outperform a cap weighted one. Any thoughts on that? Um, no, it actually doesn't, doesn't refute that idea. Uh, so, so the so-called small firm effect uh, in stocks is, is, is still there. Uh, now there's some, uh, some debate about whether that's really been present or noticeable since the first papers were published in, in, in the early 80s. Uh, but if you look at the full database, uh, the, the small firm effect is still there. So a, a portfolio of, of small firms uh, in the long run has still outperformed portfolios of, of firms in, uh, of large firms in the long run. Um, 
but uh, the, the surprising results that I've shown you that, uh, that you get this really strong skewness in the long run uh, is actually a stronger result for small stocks than big. Uh, but if you followed uh, uh, the, the points I made with the numerical example, it won't be a big surprise. Small stocks are more volatile. The more volatility you have in the short horizon returns, the more skewness you have in the long horizon returns. Anyway, it all, it all comes together. Small stocks do have a higher mean return, uh, but they have what, what I'm shining the spotlight on is that they actually have a more skewness and a lower median return. So the two facts can, can coexist and, and do coexist. Gotcha. We got a little bit of a quant type of question here. And of course, momentum always gets uh, referenced in one form or another. Uh, Michael asks, do you think this supports the momentum factor as a source of outperformance, perhaps on a longer time frame? We've talked about how the bigger companies keep getting bigger. Does this kind of support momentum in your view? Um, so I don't have a firm answer there because I haven't carefully assessed uh, uh, the role of momentum. Uh, but my general feel is I, I don't think momentum is a primary uh, explanatory factor here. Um, now, when, when you see some firms, uh, you know, doing so well over, over decades, it's, it's uh, tempting to think that that was momentum and, and maybe in some sense it was ex post for those firms. Uh, but uh, the, in the original study, I did some, uh, some simulations where I just took, uh, I simulated normally distributed monthly returns and then compounded them uh, and uh, assuming independence over time and, and showed that under uh, that assumption, you got a lot of skewness in the compounded returns. Uh, but I did it in the simulations assuming independence. So no, no momentum built in, statistical independence. Uh, the reason I, I think that's relevant here is that when I ran these simulations and, and, and they'll use them to illustrate how compounding induces this positive skewness, then I took the simulation outcomes and compared them to the actual data. So there's a ton of positive skewness in the actual data, but there's actually less positive skewness in the actual data than came out of my simulations, uh, which assumed in independent returns over time. So it seems, it seems that despite the fact that uh, uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of skewness, something is actually dampening the skewness as, as compared to what, what it would have been if we had independent, uh, statistically independent returns over time. So it might be that actually some sort of long run mean reversion is, is dampening the skewness, despite the fact that there's so much there. Given, given the, the, the discussion on skewness, uh, there's, uh, there's um, some interest on the characteristics of these winners that help drive that skewness. And George has a question here. Uh, could you say a bit about the distribution of long-term above median winners? Are there, are there even more skews suggesting that even a smaller number of stocks lead returns? So this is, a, this is something I have dug into somewhat. And uh, if you'll, you can, again, find a follow-up study uh, if you have a look on SSRN. Uh, so this, uh, you know, uh, the first most popular question was, what does this mean for active versus passive? The second was, what are the characteristics of the big winners? And, uh, and then, of course, can we, uh, can we use those characteristics to identify them in advance? Um, so uh, um, let me give the short version of, of those studies. It's, it's devilishly hard to, uh, to identify them in advance, uh, particularly with, uh, with things that can be uh, uh, quantified with, with computer uh, computer accessible data. So things like accounting data or, or uh, past return data, uh, you know, trying to pick the big winners in advance. Uh, you, you can read the paper, you know, I, I have results that appear to be a little bit better than zero, uh, but uh, you know, nobody's gonna be rich by Friday by reading, by reading my paper about uh, uh, the statistical uh, aspects. Uh, but anyway, a, a little bit closer to the question, um, if, if instead of trying to predict, uh, which is devilishly hard and, and you know, close to zero predictive ability, if we just say, uh, I, I looked at it at the decade horizon and I said, if you look within the decade, can we at least say that the firms that were big winners within the decade also had some observable characteristics within the same decade? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, you know, uh, R squareds are not high here, but there is some statistically significant stuff. So rapid, asset growth that's not driven by acquisitions or share issuances 
uh, is uh, is highly correlated with uh, with uh, uh, good stock performance in in a decade. Uh, cash growth is, although one wonders which way the causation goes uh, goes there. Uh, R and D expenditures actually come in come in positive. Anyway, there are a few there are a few factors that have some explanatory power contemporaneously, but the amount of skewness in the firm's returns for the decade uh, actually doesn't have much explanatory power. So that is, if you just take the, the monthly returns during the decade and compute the skewness, uh, it actually doesn't have much explanatory power for who ends up on top. Hmm. Interesting. Um, it was one of the things I was kind of drawn to in, in your original study was the median lifespan of a firm in the database. I think you said it was around seven and a half years. Uh, just curious, uh, in your most recent study, um, you looked at, of course, not only just globally, but also by country. Uh, have you seen a similar outcome with respect to the median lifespan of a company uh, just looking over the last 30 years? Uh, you know, I haven't explicitly uh, looked at that, so so I can't give you the number. Uh, uh, but uh, we do know that uh, that since, well, uh, I was going to say since the 70s, but I think really more since the 90s, uh, you know, there's been a large increase in uh, uh, listings of uh, younger and uh, less proven companies. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that necessarily means that... Uh, that these were bad companies uh, because you know some some big winners showed up among them, uh, but but I think uh, you know Nasdaq in particular had different listing standards than the New York Stock Exchange and and uh, I think that's changed the mix of publicly traded companies to some extent. But but again, I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a criticism. But uh, the point you made, and this was one that surprised me and other people, that uh, the, the median life of, of a company in the CRISP database only being seven and a half years, uh, the world is, is very dynamic. Uh, you know, and the, the, the capital markets are very dynamic. Um, and also we should keep in mind, you know, a, a company disappearing, um, very often uh, that's for positive reasons, not negative reasons, like they've been acquired. Uh, you know, some many many firms are delisted for for negative reasons, but uh, a lot of firms disappear from uh, from the database because they're acquired, which which is generally a good event for for shareholders, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a dynamic world. I studied ninety years of data, but uh, the median time that an individual stock was there was only seven and a half years. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. We have a question here, just kind of in terms of portfolio strategy from David. Um, the question goes, when portfolio managers rebalance, they usually sell part of their winners and buy more of their losers. Uh, on the other hand, you hear traders often say, sell your losers and let your winners run. Do the findings of this study kind of tilt in one direction or the other? Do you have a, a take on that? You know, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that my study per se uh, gives us uh, new insights about rebalancing. There's, there's obviously active debates about, uh, uh, active debate about rebalancing out there. Um, I can say that that in some of my uh, my uh, ongoing work that's not yet in a public working paper, um, I, I've evaluated uh, uh, the the basic question is if you've got some winner stocks, do you want to ride them or do you want to uh, uh, do you want to rebalance? Uh, and uh, this is kind of preliminary, but it's uh, it's looking like rebalancing enhances uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's not as simple as uh, simply identifying a stock that has been a winner and, and uh, uh, assuming it'll continue to go. Uh, so it, it's kind of preliminary, but it looks like rebalancing is, uh, is, is helpful even in a portfolio, even amongst a portfolio of winner stocks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, I was actually drawn to one of the descriptions or the, the, the ways you've, you've described the arithmetic, arithmetic mean versus geometric mean versus dollar weighted mean. And one of the things you said was when you use an arithmetic mean, uh, means over time or arithmetic returns over time, it's almost an implicit assumption that you are uh, basically investing a constant dollar amount at every period that that return is measured, which I thought was a, was a fantastic way to describe that. Well, thanks. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about that here today. There's so much stuff and only yeah. so much can be covered in an hour, but uh, you know, the, uh, the problems with using the arithmetic mean of short horizon returns uh, to, to think about long horizon outcomes I mean that's that's not that's not a new uh, uh, idea. Uh, Richard has, has written on that uh, a, a number of decades ago, uh, uh, along with along with other people. Uh, but this is something we routinely teach in an introductory finance course. Uh, we, we show them what happens if you take an arithmetic mean and compound it, and how you you know it doesn't match your long horizon outcome, and you should be focusing on geometric means. 
Uh, anyway, there's a close, close parallel here. Uh, but at the risk of being overly critical, uh, much of the academic literature um, takes short horizon returns and then studies their arithmetic means. Uh, alpha is an arithmetic mean return. And if it's computed for monthly returns, it's, it's, a, it's, it's literally a conditional arithmetic mean, uh, but it's an arithmetic mean. Um, that's all fine if, you're, if your investment horizon is a month or your, your entire focus is on monthly returns. But if you have a 10 year horizon uh, to look at arithmetic means of, of monthly returns, um, well, let's just say it's potentially uh, misleading. And, and, and the foundation of why it's potentially misleading is covered in introductory finance courses. Mm -hmm. We got a question here just kind of on the methodology. And I think uh, um, you've already uh, covered this, but the, someone was just questioning whether uh, the sample only includes firms that were present present for the whole 30 year period. Would there be any survivorship bias potentially altering some of the interpretations? Uh, so if, if the study had only included the ones that are there for the whole 30 years, there would have been a, a tremendous survivorship bias. Uh, so it, it includes uh, every stock uh, regardless of how long it's uh, in, in the database. So, so in that sense, it, it doesn't have any survivor bias because it, it's, you know, it's more or less the universe of stocks that have been, uh, been publicly traded. Mm -hmm. it, does make, uh, it does make some of the interpretation of the statistics harder. So like when I say, when I say that the skewness of lifetime returns is this number, uh, that's partially attributable. Well, some of those stocks were there for six months and some of those stocks were there for 30 years. Uh, so, so it, it makes some of the statistics a little harder to uh, to interpret, but uh, but there's there's no survivorship bias because uh, it is uh, every stock, whether it's there for a short time or a long time. And I recall you used the example of General Motors in your original study, not the post two thousand nine stock, but the pre two thousand nine stock, and it was fascinating because conventional wisdom you'd say that that stock was delisted, it was a wealth destroyer, but you actually. I think you said that that was a wealth creator given the amount of capital return it had during its lifetime. Um, so it's it's uh, very um, deceptive if you try to judge something at the at a, wherever its you know lifespan ends uh, and how it ends um, you know because that that stock was dealers at sixty cents a share. So um, again, lots of great observations. Of course, the the, the message is for everyone. If you really want to see it, you got to read the papers. So um, we're going to try to get through some more of these questions here. Um, <clears throat> We got one from Joel. For the big winners, what fraction of the time do they outperform? Uh, do you have a sense on that? Uh, no, I didn't specifically look at that. Uh, um, I do have uh, uh, another paper that uh, focuses on drawdowns. So this doesn't this doesn't specifically go to your go to your question, uh, Joel. Uh, um, but let's let's take Apple for example. So you know, Apple, the best long run performance of any any stock in terms of dollar wealth creation. You know that you might then think, well, does that mean it outperformed regularly? And I don't have the exact uh, percentage. You know, I can't tell you what percentage of months uh, uh, Apple outperformed the market. Uh, but this uh, study of drawdowns, what I showed is that even the big winners had some painful drawdowns uh, at various points uh, in in their history. Uh, so I'm kind of going from memory here uh, rather than exact numbers. But uh, uh, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Amazon. Uh, now, going from memory, don't, don't uh, be too hard on me if I don't get this exactly right, but I believe Amazon had either two or three different drawdowns of more than 90%. Uh, Apple had a drawdown of more than 90%. Microsoft, I don't think it was quite that big, but they had some 60% drawdowns. So even the big winners have some, uh, have some rough patches along the way. Sure, sure. Um, we're getting close to the end of time here. So I appreciate all the questions. We'll try to get through the remainder as quick as we can. And maybe if we have time, a little bit of time left, I'll pop a little trivia question for folks um, at, at the very end here. So uh, we've got a question from um, uh, from Chang. Uh, so regarding your mutual fund study. So for an average individual investor, should I sell my winner mutual funds or my loser mutual funds when you're rebalancing? Does your paper indicate that top mutual fund performers would deliver persistent good performance in the future. Well, a great question, and, and I really don't have uh, I really don't have a precise answer to it. So uh, so let me not not make conjectures. Uh, uh, but uh, great questions, and uh, I'm uh, have a uh, have a meeting with my co-authors on that paper this afternoon. Maybe I'll uh, suggest some additional uh, analyses. <laughs> Well, actually, um, uh, on that note, I wanted to kind of follow up on one of the conclusions you had um, on your most recent study. It was one of the last conclusions, I believe, 
Um, and, and I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on that. You mentioned that um, the degree of wealth concentration uh, within uh, the companies uh, that you've identified, it can pre presents a challenge to capital market and in industrial organization theorists. I was wondering if you can kind of elaborate on what you mean by this, um, because it looks like it's got some cross applications in other disciplines as well. Uh, sure. So uh, um, I was surprised when I first ran these numbers out. Uh, you know, a, a punchline like 4% uh, of the stocks explain all of the net wealth creation over the last 90 years was striking to me, too. Uh, or if, if we go to the most recent 30-year uh, study that 1% one, 1 of the non-U.S. stocks uh, explained all of, the, all of the wealth creation over, over the last 30 years outside the U.S., uh, those seem like striking, striking numbers. Um, and... Uh, uh, one of the papers I didn't have a chance to touch on today, that the degree to which wealth creation is concentrated seems to have accelerated in, in recent years. And, and I don't have a really solid explanation for that, although uh, uh, I reference a paper uh, that, that argued that uh, the internet economy is going to facilitate winner take all type outcomes, uh, you know, with Amazon being, being a case study uh, to, uh, to consider there. Um, but, but here's what I had in mind. So uh, in, in some sense, we shouldn't be surprised that there is concentration of wealth creation. Uh, for one thing, there's purely random outcomes. Some stocks get great returns, some stocks get, get poor returns. So that's gonna give us some, some concentration of wealth creation. And I am working in dollar amounts. Uh, so you know, there's big firms and small firms and that's gonna give us some, some concentration of wealth creation. Uh, and then some firms are there for decades, other firms disappear after a few years, that's gonna give us some, some concentration. So you know, we shouldn't be surprised that there is concentration of wealth creation but there's really a lot of concentration. So, so kind of the challenge I, I, I threw out there for people who study uh, the economy, uh, industrial organization economists or, or others, um, is if you model a dynamic economy, firms, firms are launched, some, some succeed, some get acquired, some fail. Uh, there's technological innovations that open the door for new firms to be launched. You know, well, when we consider all of these things, should we be surprised that it's so concentrated? You know, it, it, it may be that when somebody puts together an integrated model of our dynamic economy, uh, they're gonna say, well, you know, this really isn't surprising at all. It's, it's exactly what you should have expected uh, uh, when you consider all of the moving parts of an entrepreneurial economy. And, and uh, you know, if, if that's how it plays out, uh, say, great, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for explaining that. Uh, but for the moment, uh, you know, I still find it kind of surprising how how concentrated the uh, wealth creation is. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. Just when you look, when the, the, I don't remember the long term skew stats, but the way that the skew, positive skew, grows dramatically as you extend the, the return horizon is just amazing. Um, we'll try to get through a couple more questions, and then I'll I'll see if I can pop a trivia question. We got one person just kind of focusing in again on the winners. Um, I kind of think about the Charlie Munger saying where he says, if you want to understand um, uh, something, you kind of have to invert it. So it's, it's curious that we're not getting any questions about the losers, <laughs> but uh, so, but in any case, uh, we got a question about uh, the winners here, the top 40% of stocks, so which account for the skewed performance um, from 1992, actually it's 2020, not 2016. I think you might, that person might be referring to your prior study, but are they the same stocks or are some of these or do, or do some of these uh, stocks fall off and are they replaced by new entrants in this group? Um, it's dynamic. Uh, so um, in one of the studies that's, uh, that's up on SSRN, um, I, I believe the title is along the lines of characteristics of, of uh, uh, big winners. What are their characteristics? I think that's the title to help people find it. Uh, so uh, I as I mentioned, I, I, I am able to identify some characteristics that, uh, that are associated with doing well in a given, in a given decade. Uh, but when I include, uh, when I do it in a multiple regression setting, or kind of a statistical horse race, uh, whether, whether one was on the uh, winner's list in the prior decade has almost no forecast power for whether one's on the winner's list in a given decade. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a dynamic economy. You know, even... Uh, when I drafted the first paper, it had data through 2000 to 2015. Uh, and I have versions of the study that, that are updated through nearly the end of 2020. Even in that five years, the, the lifetime list has, uh, has been dynamic. I mean, Exxon was, Exxon Mobil was, was number one when I first drafted the paper. Now it's still high on the list, uh, 
uh, but it's stumbled. General Electric was high on the list when I first drafted it. They've, they've stumbled. Uh, so it is dynamic. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, a firm is on the list for one decade uh, uh, is uh, not at all a guarantee that it'll be there again the next decade. Yeah. We've got a question here, um, and we'll try to wrap it up after this one here, but we got a question here that kind of seems philosophical. Now, you mentioned in your presentation that it's it's kind of a preference whether you prefer positive skew. Uh, it's, just, it's up to you, but um, I'm kind of, this. there might be a lot to read into this, but um, this person's asking, is reducing portfolio standard de- deviation a desired outcome? Um, I, I, I think that uh, that's in, with respect to how the more volatility, as you mentioned, the more skew, and of course, the more skew that right. has, you have those potential for the really outside out- outcome. So <laughs> how would you answer that question? Well, just to say that there really is a trade-off here. Uh, so, you know, standard portfolio theory and, and, and what we routinely teach in, in investment management courses uh, focuses on the fact that diversification reduces volatility, standard deviation or variance, which is undeniably, undeniably true. Um, Less well recognized, but also true, is that uh, 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 diversification reduces skewness. So, if you did have a preference for skewness, there's there's a there's a trade off. Uh, being more diversified reduces your volatility, but it also reduces your skewness. Uh, there were some researchers at Morningstar uh, who actually uh, <clears throat> followed up uh, on that point and have tried to quantify that the trade off between uh, volatility reduction and skewness reduction that, that comes from diversification. And uh, right offhand, I can't think of the uh, the reference, but if somebody wants to drop me an email, I'll uh, I'll uh, steer you to that uh, paper. Sounds good. So I'm going to actually have uh, Dick Michaud um, come back up and ask you one final question. So Dick, uh, please come on up and ask away. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And, and again, thank you, Hank. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, a lot of people are very interested in all of these issues. And uh, I, I think... Uh, it, it's definitely true that uh, you, you've raised a lot of questions about equity risk, uh, fundamentally about equity risk. And I think that's uh, something people need to understand when they make uh, investment decisions. And one of the things that you did, did emphasize has to do with the issue of uh, the mean and the variance or the sharp ratio or alpha and so on, and how in some sense they're really just useful on a short-term basis and not really for a longer-term basis. So I think this is an extraordinarily important and reliable point that you're really making in your paper. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important. But the other th- point that I would make, and given that I, I, I go back a, a few decades in this crazy business, um, and you may want, you probably uh, know that, that chapter six in Harry's book, okay? Yeah, where he talks about the efficient frontier and needs to be culled so that not all of it is long-term efficient. And so he focuses on the geometric mean or the expected geometric mean, I should say, uh, for understanding what efficient portfolios mean. And so he's justifying the mean variance uh, uh, optimization process in terms of of the geometric mean of the portfolios, okay, that are on the efficient frontier, and and actually, you know, if you if you followed uh, Harry's career, uh, he's got this wonderful 1976 paper that talks about long-term risk and return, and so uh, the, the the way to think about shorter t- uh, uh, portfolio optimality has got to do in Harry's idea, and also in mine, of course, in terms of the distribution of of the, as much as anything of the geometric mean rather than the mean invariance of return. Yeah, so uh, um, let me just say I'm, uh, I'm sympathetic to the argument. Uh, You know, I've, I've gone a little bit out of my way here to, uh, to poke at the idea of using arithmetic means computed from short horizon returns by investors who have, have longer uh, uh, investment horizons. Uh, but I think the geometric mean uh, uh, you know, captures uh, much of what a long horizon investor would, uh, would care about. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, what, you know, wherever in my papers I refer to buy and hold returns, that's, that's just the geometric mean return compounded. Uh, so, uh, so definitely going the same direction. 
so Richard, I know you've you've worked in this area and uh, Markowitz and uh, you know other uh, uh, other uh, leading lights uh, from uh, from that era, Heim Levy, for example. Uh, 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 you know, uh, to to the extent I can connect my uh, my work to uh, uh, solid academic work, I find myself reading and, and citing the papers from the 1970s. So I, I do think there's some there were some things that were considered back then that have kind of uh, the, the spotlight is not being uh, shown on them anymore, and uh, maybe it should be again. With that said, Hank, if you don't mind, I'd like to see if we could uh, end on a quick uh, trivia question for everyone before we let you go. Um, and, 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 I, and I like this just only because, um, first of all, I was um, amazed uh, at the statistic uh, when you highlighted it in your original report. And of course, anyone who's read the original report uh, will, will know the answer. So, But I want to ask anyways, because it also underscores the, 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 the complexity of the data and how you kind of have to evaluate uh, the, the capital return that a company provides to, to shareholders over its lifetime. So let me go ahead and pull up the poll here and um, do a quick screen share. And the question, the trivia question is as follows, and let's see if everyone can guess this one. So based on the time frame of the 2018 study uh, from 1926 to 2016, which stock below had the greatest lifetime buy and hold return? Um, can, can anyone think they can guess the answer? Let me go ahead and launch that right now. And I'll give uh, about a minute for everyone to vote. And we'll see if everyone can, anyone can guess this. Can I throw in just one uh, one clarification? Sure. Um, firm firm names change over time, uh, yep. so the firm names that are uh, uh, you know the the name of a given entity changes over time. So the names that are listed in my study are the most recent name associated with an entity. It may have had different names uh, earlier in its uh, earlier in it, in that entity's life. Sure. In, indeed. Indeed. Almost half of you have voted so far. Interesting seeing the results coming in. Um, and I'm going to share that shortly, but uh, let's see if we can get a few more squeezed in. About three quarters of you coming in. All right, a few more seconds. Let's go ahead and three, two, one. Let's stop this poll. Let's go ahead and share the result here and show what everyone voted for. So it looks like the winner that you picked was ExxonMobil. Um, and quite a few of you went for Apple, but th about 30, one third of you went for ExxonMobil. 11% for, went for Berkshire Hathaway. I thought that number would have been higher. Um, I will have to say if this audience was on the game show, Who Wants to Be a, Mil Who Wants to be a Millionaire? And this was a lifeline. <laughs> uh, this lifeline would have gone to waste because um, uh, the uh, plurality or uh, uh, did not pick the right answer. The correct answer here is going to be Altria. And if I could just scribble on my screen here, uh, I had to reread this, but 244.3 million percent for Altria, um, which underscores that, you know, when you looked at this, and, and Hank, you can kind of speak to this more, but um, there's a lot more to the picture than just the the observations of monthly returns. It's the spinoffs, it's the, uh, the, the dividends that are paid, the share buybacks and so forth. Um, but I, th I thought what that was really fascinating. I don't know if you had any uh, interesting uh, other observations on this. Just that I was also uh, surprised when I saw that number, 244 million uh, percent uh, buy and hold return. Uh, and just in case not everybody's familiar with Altria, uh, you know, names have changed, uh, uh, you know, mergers and spinoffs happen. But the, uh, the, this is the same legal entity that uh, at earlier times was uh, Philip Morris USA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, excellent. Well, we this was a fantastic presentation, and um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, if, for those of you who are really interested in your work, I, I highly recommend uh, reading the research papers. They're they're a great read, um, and there's a, just they're chock full of fascinating data. Uh, before we part ways with the audience today, Hank, any any final parting comments that you have? Well, I know I think I had a pretty good chance to uh, to relay the uh, the high points. Uh, I guess I just would, would second uh, Gary. There's there there is a lot more there, including conceptual issues that we didn't get a chance to talk about today. So there's there's both uh, there's both the empirical facts and and uh, uh, you know there's kind of a different take on how we measure uh, different ways of measuring uh, uh, 
stock performance when we consider long horizons. So uh, if you're interested, uh, uh, I, do, I do recommend having a look at the papers themselves and uh, feel free to reach out to me. One thing about having a unique last name like mine is I'm, I'm easy to find. <laughs> I think I can relate in some ways too, but uh, thanks again. I really appreciate this. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks to all of you who have joined. Please make sure to visit our website, cfaboston.org to see our upcoming events. Will you, you'll also be able to see the, the remaining two installments of our uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, the next one's going to be in April with Roberto Rigobon from MIT. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Thanks again. And until the next time, please be well. Take care. <laughs>